Hi, it's Katrina. From being able to live without oxygen to the complex navigational abilities of butterflies, here are eight unsolved biological mysteries. Number eight, no oxygen? In 2010, a research team discovered evidence of an animal that lives entirely without oxygen at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, one of the most extreme environments on Earth. Who knew? This species belongs to an unusual group called Lorisiferans, which wasn't discovered until the 1980s. Lorisiferans live in muddy sediments at the bottom of the sea, which theoretically should contain enough oxygen for them to breathe. Roberto Danovaro of the Polytechnic University of Marche, Italy, and his colleagues spent a decade traveling the depths of the Latalante Basin, a hypersaline brine lake on the Mediterranean seabed off the coast of Crete. Ancient salt deposits buried beneath the ocean floor have dissolved into the sea, causing the water to become extra dense and salty, and the inner part of the basin is completely devoid of oxygen. The oxygen-free water does not mix with the oxygen-rich water above, and instead gets trapped in seafloor valleys. This layer of water has been in place for upwards of 50,000 years. The team did not expect to find higher life forms at the bottom of the Latalante Basin. To their surprise, however, they discovered three new species of lorisiferans thriving in the mud. In addition to contending with oxygen levels of zero, these lorisiferans live in extremely salty water that would dry out normal cells and are also surrounded by poisonous sulfides. Until then, scientists knew that some animals can spend part of their lives without oxygen by living in the intestine. However, this was their first discovery of an animal that apparently needs no oxygen at all, challenging all previous understandings about the metabolisms of animals. Animals. Number 7. Why do we age? According to Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection, individuals with traits that prevent aging would hypothetically supersede their peers, and characteristics associated with aging would eventually fail to be genetically passed on to future generations. As you know by now, that's not how things worked out. After all, we do age, don't we? But why? It's a question scientists have been debating from an evolutionary standpoint since the 1800s and are still trying to figure out. In 1953, biologist George C. Williams proposed his theory of antagonistic pleiotropy, which suggests that a gene may be responsible for more than one trait, and that one trait may be beneficial while the other is detrimental. Therefore, aging would be adaptive from an evolutionary standpoint if it was caused by the same gene responsible for reproductive success in early life. In late 2017, researchers at the Institute of Molecular Biology in Mainz, Germany made a breakthrough in understanding why humans age by studying a type of worm called C. elegans. They discovered the genes responsible for autophagy, a physiological process that promotes health among young worms but propels their aging later on in life and involves the body self-devouring its damaged cells. The research, which was published in the journal Genes and Development, located 30 genes in C. elegans that represent various aspects of the aging process. Among them are genes that work in an antagonistic fashion by promoting aging, particularly among old specimens. Additionally, the researchers discovered a series of genes that regulate autophagy by accelerating the aging process. Worms lived longer when those key genes were shut down early on in the process. Scientists have a lot to learn when it comes to understanding biological aging, but so far they've concluded that the process is an evolutionary quirk. With enough wishful thinking, maybe they'll eventually find the fountain of youth. Number 6. Why do we have a dominant hand? The term handedness simply means the tendency to be right or left-handed. Between 85 and 90% of all humans are right-handed, which makes sense since the left hemisphere of the brain, which is responsible for speech and writing, controls the right hand. The right hemisphere of the brain is associated with imagination and creativity and controls the left hand. Researchers at the University of Oxford, St. Andrews, Bristol, and the Max Planck Institute in the Netherlands found that whether someone will be left or right-handed is likely associated with a specific network of genes, and that this determination is made in the womb. The human brain is asymmetrical, meaning each side is responsible for certain functions. While the left hemisphere manages thinking and intellectual skills, for the most part, the right hemisphere controls most emotional functions. Several species of mammals exhibit use of a dominant hand, including gorillas, chimpanzees, and even dogs. Humans have been predominantly right-handed for more than 500,000 years. Are you right-handed or left-handed? Let me know in the comments below. So why do we have a dominant hand? Nobody knows for certain, but one theory is that humans naturally have finer wiring on the side of their brain associated with speech, 
which is typically the left, leading most people to be right-handed. This theory is not foolproof, however, because while all lefties control speech from their brain's left hemisphere, not all right-handed people do. I'll put it this way, science is still trying to figure this out. Number 5. Why do we have an appendix? The human appendix has long been categorized as an evolutionary holdover, or an essentially useless or decreasingly necessary body part that once served a major function, such as wisdom teeth, pinky toes, and tailbones. The ability to remove the appendix without any major drawbacks has historically been perceived as evidence of the organ's inconsequentiality. In recent years, scientists have started questioning the assumption that the appendix is pointless, and their research has pointed them in various directions. Some feel that the appendix may train the immune system during fetal development. Others think it serves as a safe house for bacteria and microbes that aid in digestion. The latter is more likely. In 2007, scientists announced a possible breakthrough in figuring out what the appendix is actually for. They admitted that the proposed purpose couldn't be proven, but that newly available information about the role of bacteria in intestinal health made for a strong case about the appendix. Researcher William Parker, PhD, an assistant professor of experimental surgery at Duke University Medical Center, feels confident that all signs point toward the appendix being a place where the good bacteria can live safe and undisturbed until they are needed. Because studies on the appendix are hard to conduct and very few species have one, not much is known about the organ. However, more and more researchers are being led to believe that the appendix is designed to protect good bacteria, and that it has the ability to rapidly release good bacteria into the digestive system after experiencing diarrhea or another intestine cleaning illness. But if something goes wrong, you can take it out and be totally fine. Our bodies are pretty amazing. Number 4. Monarch Butterfly Migration the Great Migration of Monarch Butterflies from Canada to Mexico is one of nature's greatest journeys, and until recently one of its biggest mysteries. Monarch butterflies are the only insects to migrate such a vast distance, and no single butterfly has ever lived through an entire migration cycle. Throughout the two-month journey, the traveling butterflies cycle through several generations. How then do the butterflies know to travel to a few relatively small overwintering spots? In April 2016, after many years of wondering, members of the perplexed scientific community published cutting-edge research in the journal Cell Reports. The research was conducted by a team of mathematicians and biologists who set out to mimic the internal compass used by monarch butterflies on their journey. Professor Eli Schleiserman, a mathematician from the University of Washington, teamed up with biologist Stephen Reppert from the University of Massachusetts and other colleagues to record directly from the neurons of the butterfly's antenna and eyes. In doing so, they determined that the butterfly's input cues depended entirely on the sun, which gives them an internal compass and clock throughout their southerly travels. The discovery came at a crucial time for the monarch butterfly population, which has hit historic lows in recent years, and scientists hope to build a robotic butterfly to track the migration and learn more about how to conserve the species. Number 3. Where did Ebola come from? When it comes to Ebola, there are two big mysteries. Where did Ebola come from and where does it hide between outbreaks? The West African Ebola epidemic ended in April 2016. Ebola resurfaced in the Democratic Republic of Congo in the spring of 2018 and quickly spread from the countryside to the city of Bandaka, which has a population of around 350,000. It's a zoonotic virus, meaning it can spread between humans and animals. When Ebola isn't busy destroying human lives, it needs a safe house or a reservoir to lay low. But nobody knows where that is, and if we want to stem future epidemics, it's important for us to find out. Fruit bats have received much of the blame for the recurring re-emergence of Ebola. Bats can carry the virus without symptoms and often overlap with humans geographically, so it makes sense. A study led by Eric Leroy and published in 2005 in the journal Nature found evidence of symptomless Ebola infections in three species of fruit bats out of over 1,000 small vertebrates that were tested. These bats, which are commonly hunted as bushmeat, could be the Ebola reservoir. Of course, not everyone agrees. Fabian Lienderts of the Robert Koch Institute in Berlin points the finger at the insectivorous Mops condylaris bats as the reservoir. The 2014 Ebola epidemic was traced to a two-year-old boy in Guinea who may have been playing inside a large hollow cola tree before falling ill. This popular neighborhood play spot was also a known roost for Mops condylaris bats. The tree had been burned down by the time researchers arrived to investigate. Virologist Jens Kuhn of the U.S. Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at Fort Dedrick, Maryland, believes that humans and bats live too closely to one another for bats to be the reservoir. If it really comes from bats, it would happen way more often. In 2015, Kuhn told National Geographic that he thinks Ebola will be discovered in a strange host, such as insects or fungi. Number 2. 
Homing. Homing is the innate ability of certain animals to navigate through unfamiliar areas toward an original location, such as a breeding area or a home territory. In other words, always finding your way back home, even after being displaced or traveling great distances. These animals use the same navigational cues that are used in migration, such as the angle of the sun, the Earth's magnetic field, and star patterns. Unlike migratory species, however, homing can occur during any season and in any compass direction. Birds are among the best-known examples of a strong homing ability, especially homing pigeons. Many birds are known to have equal or better homing abilities than the homing pigeon, including seabirds and swallows. Some non-avian animals have homing abilities, including sea turtles, reptiles, and fishes. Other animals might too, such as dogs and cats that found their way to their family after they moved, and countless other stories. So how does homing work exactly? In a January 2013 Life Science article, writer Tia Ghos announced that this long-standing mystery may have finally been solved. New research showed that homing pigeons may use low-frequency sound waves to mentally map their location. This would also explain why these amazing navigators sometimes get completely lost. Their home loft is out of reach of these low-frequency sound waves. United States Geological Survey geologist John Hagstrom spent years trying to understand why homing pigeons suddenly lose their superior navigational skills during flight. He realized that pigeons rely on infrasound waves to get where they're going. In instances where pigeons get lost, it was typically traced to an interference with those infrasound waves. Number 1. What are Plagozoans? Plagozoans are the simplest of all known non-parasitic multicellular animals. These three-layered organisms are small, flat, and roughly 1 to 3 millimeters in diameter. They contain the smallest amount of DNA of any animal and can reproduce both sexually and asexually. Plagozoans were first discovered living along the wall of an Australian aquarium in 1883. They were exclusively studied by scientists for over a century in laboratories throughout the world. Later, scientists started finding them in the wilds near the end of the 20th century. They are found in tropical and subtropical waters all over the place. So why does everyone care about them? The only species of Plagozoa conclusively known to exist is the Trichoplax adherens. Despite having studied them for so long, very little is known about this tiny critter, and so they've earned the nickname of the taxonomic tabula rasa, or blank slate. It's unknown how many species there are really, what they eat, their ecological importance, or where they rank on the hierarchy of life. And why are they everywhere? Thanks for watching! Be sure to subscribe and leave any theories and answers to these biological mysteries in the comments below. I'd love to see what you think. See you next time! Bye!